In 2007, it was 50 years since BBC Radio set out to deliver ball-by-ball coverage of all Test match cricket in this country. Since then, there's been the poetic elegance of Arlott, the japes and cakes of Jonas, and the exuberance of Jonathan Agnew. For the 50th, Rory Bremner looked back at what for some has been a rather elite club, but for thousands of others has been as vivid a herald of summer as the smell of cut grass. For 50 years now, Test Match Special has been a national treasure, as English as Afternoon Tea, the Tower of London and Chicken Tikka Masala. I've loved it since I was a child, so keen to share the commentary that I once snatched the earpiece from out of a fellow schoolboy's ear, only to discover he was deaf and I'd removed his hearing aid. Sorry, Duckworth. And it was all because I wanted to hear the unique and authentic voice of summer. And a very good morning to you and welcome to Lords for the start of a, a long summer of cricket and the start of our celebrations marking 50 years of Test Match Special. And uh, bearing that in mind... And the Eight to back the series, and a little semicircular walk, a little scuffle of the feet, a few stalking, walking strides, breaks into a run, bowls... And into cab turns this off the inside. Beggars, for goodness sake, stop it. Again, bows to Dilly. Dilly carves his way. Four runs. That was a magnificent stroke. Oh, my heavens. <laughs> Did he, mate? What a cake that is. That is the biggest chocolate cake I've ever seen. It's a monster. And he's bowled him. Cleaners, absolutely. Middle stump knocked out. There we saw it again. Pitching the ball up. On to a length. And the letter the says, Dear forward, sirs, I note your interest in the number of green and white topped buses passing the Headingley Cricket Ground. Good job I'm you're an objective observer of the game, Donna, because otherwise you could be a bit downhearted. Well, I'm totally objective. <laughs> I should really say good evening to all of the listeners in England, and I'm sure a joyous listening public too, with England roaring right back. And the oh, West thank you, Donna. Thank you, Aggers and Blurs, Fred, Neville and Victor, and welcome to what promises to be a very pleasant hour's reminiscence. A look back at 50 years of ball-by-ball commentary of England Test Match Cricket. But why? Why are we making a programme about a programme that's essentially just sports coverage? Isn't that as exciting as yesterday's news or last week's weather forecast? Well, maybe it's because, as in the world of P.G. Woodhouse, different rules apply. Names are changed. Brian Johnson becomes Johnners. Blofeld, Blowers. Agnew, Aggers. Test Match Special, TMS. And an all-pervading air of bonhomie chortles over the airwaves. It is unbelievable. I'm sorry. All you want is somebody out there with a top hat and tails and a, <laughs> and a big whip, and we, we, we and and get the elephants moving, and we're in business. <laughs> it, it is unbelievable. It's certainly very unusual. Um, unusual. <laughs> the late, the great, and the eternally slightly less than chuffed Fred Truman, with his straight man Christopher Martin Jenkins. Oh, good old C. Andre. For me, it's it's all about the first Test Match special of the year you, that you listen to. You feel it's the beginning of a whole new season of cricket. And it's just something very, very special about it that's actually quite difficult to describe to people. Pigeons have shifted now to behind mid-on. They all, I don't know who gives the signal when they've consumed the number of... I don't think it's worms. I think it's seed they go for. It brings a grip satisfaction and happiness to millions of other people who are not that interested in cricket and yet cricket becomes special to them through TMS so it does cricket and an enormous service you, you think pigeons don't eat worms they must do but um, I'm sure somebody wrote in and said that uh, they're not carnivorous which means they wouldn't eat worms it is a sound of summer I think to me happiness <laughs> Just all the nice things, all the sweet things about summer, really. I bet if I offered a worm to a pigeon, it would eat it. Will you get one for me, boy? I'll get one of, <laughs> one of Blur's thoughtful-looking pigeons. We'll offer it a worm. I bet it would eat it. You know, they're just like old friends, the regulars and the commentators who come in from time to time. I mean, it's, it's like joining a... I suppose like joining a club and, and going and seeing familiar faces, or in this case, familiar voices. We've got to get a worm also. I haven't got that. Here is Lawrence coming in again, running in from the box all in, bells to Richards, who drives that one, a beautiful stroke, four runs, and no question of any movement to mid-off at all by Rampercat, he went there. Amongst the pigeons you heard MP Kate Hoey, former England players Graham Fowler and Sarah Potter, and Robert Fleming, chairman of the programme's adopted charity, the Primary Club. They sum up all the strengths and hint at the reservations some people have about this strange institution. It's been suggested very often to me, usually by uh, people trying to uh, make changes to the programme, that our audiences 
very old. Peter Baxter. Ah, oh, good old Backers. The producer of Test Match Special for over 30 years. And, through letters and emails, the man with the best idea of his programme's listenership. It is very interesting to see how much across the age range and the social range of the country it does go, the reactions we get. We have occasionally, particularly in places like uh, New Zealand in the middle of the night, Jonathan Agnew will say, I'm fascinated to know who's listening to us because you re do reach the point when you think maybe there are two lorry drivers on the M6 who are the only people who are awake. And the raft of extraordinary things that come in from listeners. There was a, a vet who was putting a pacemaker into a Scotty dog. There was a man who decided to save the maintenance on his lawnmowers to the middle of the night so he could listen to us uh, while he worked on his lawnmowers at sort of three in the morning somewhere in Leicestershire. And then there's this huge raft of students. We know there's a good solid core of Middle England out there listening. Mm -hmm. But our job is like the cricketer's job in a way, to, to make cricket appealing, to make people want to get into the game. And, and therefore, when you've got young people tuning in and, and, and joining in the fun, well, that's, that, then you know you're, you're getting through. And Prime Ministers tune in too. <laughs> oh, yes. And as a new captain takes over at Westminster and starts to select his side... Uh, uh, look, do we really need two spinners? It was good to spend a couple of hours with the current linchpin of the programme, Jonathan Agnew trying to unpick the reasons why this audience of vets, students, lawmakers and lawnmower repairmen should remain so loyal. It has to be more than the usual clichés about japes, cakes and breaks for rain. At the heart of it all is cricket, and a rule established by the programme's pioneers back in 1957. In fact, more than a rule, more of a religious observance... Uh, in comes Flintoff now. ...of every ball that's bowled. With his burly bustling approach over a game that lasts and Sobers lets it go harmlessly by outside off stump for five days and there's no run and there's no run there and there's no run fielded by Jarvis and there's no run it's the test match special Amen and there is no run and Underwood comes in also in variety who goes forward and caught caught by Ellingworth that silly point First ball, so Underwood is on a hat-trick at 69 for 7. Oh, a wicket, a wicket, jolly good. Uh, and the programme's going along nicely now, uh, but we really need a bit of history here. And I've got a letter sent by a Miss Gay uh, Tone with it. <laughs> Stop it, Haggers. Uh, and she... <laughs> She writes, Dear Jonas, I'll be serious now, uh, given that ball-by-ball -ball cricket commentaries were available to World Service listeners in the 1940s, why did it take the BBC so long to provide the same service at home? Uh, well, we can answer that with the help of the broadcaster and cricket writer David Raven Allen. An excellent choice, Brian. A man with an ear for the penetrating question. Where do you put it? I mean, where else would you get a programme that's open-ended for how many hours? It's created a major difficulty for the broadcaster, the BBC in this case. Something completely new happens in British Radio on May the 30th, 1957, the date on which the first of this year's five test matches opens at Edgbaston. On that day, and on all subsequent days of test play, the British listener will be able to hear a full ball-by-ball -ball account of the proceedings. How will this be done? The Radio Times in an edition whose front cover featured Peter May, all brill-creamed hair and impeccable whites, executing an immaculate cover drive. For the occasion, the transmitters which normally radiate the third programme will be brought into use twice during each day to transmit cricket. And when the third programme transmitters are not in operation, then the light programme will be doing the job. Don't miss a ball. We broadcast them all. He has been said severely. Ramadan is having a word with Goddard. The offside fielder is one slip, a man at point, square with the wicket, cover and mid-off. It was a match against the West Indies which started Test Match Special with E.W. Swanton doing the summaries. And Arlott still there, yes, and was Alston or had Alston gone by then? No, I think he was still there. And Kenneth Black would have been broadcasting for the West Indies. 116 for four. Rammed into Bailey, shorter, and that one off the inside edge. And Subas throws himself across to the left, gets a hand to it. Uh, Ramadan holds his head. Now Ramadan again to Bailey. Bailey forward and he's bold. All the hallmarks were already there. The presence, unusual on British radio, of an overseas accent in the form of a visiting commentator. The measured descriptions, an England first innings collapse, 
Even the unfortunate batsman, Trevor Bailey, was to become a lasting fixture. Oh, good old Boyle. And then, in the second innings, the sun came out for England. And with a preposterously high score on the board, I can hand you back to Rex Alston. Smith Bell shot. Cowdery has placed it gently towards third man. And the extra applause is because the partnership is now worth the monumental figure of 400. And that would have been the series, of course, in which May and Cowdery famously defeated the wiles of Ramadan by using their pads and put on that massive, what is it, 411 together. I think the imagination starts to boggle at this all this business about records. We're getting tired. I should think Roy Webber's drooling records there. Somewhere else along in this in this box. And now May 247 faces Sobers. And May has hit the next one high in the air, six into the pavilion. Although Rex Alston was a good model to follow, according to David Raven Allen, the standard had already been set by Alston's fellow commentator, John Arlott. Arlott didn't have a great technical knowledge of cricket. He would go round the dressing rooms and he would glean what he could from his friends in the dressing room and be asking constant questions. And they used to laugh at them because they knew what he was doing. But what he did have, he had a poet's background where you had Alston, who was the schoolmaster, who'd had, if you like, a classical background. And he knew when not to speak. He was not afraid of the pregnant pause. He would talk about the bowler bowling the ball and he walks back to his mark. Well, the sun is out quite brightly, and Trilmer's to bowl from the Kirkstall end, with Australia 102 for four, 40 ahead with six wickets standing, comes in, bowls to O'Neill, and O'Neill plays that wide of forward short leg. Was, I would have thought, an off You felt that you were there, at Lord's and the Oval and, and Headingley and... These are names of places that I could imagine what they looked like, but they rolled off my tongue quite easily. Broadcaster Darkus Howe was a schoolboy in Trinidad at that time, and already a cricket fanatic. When I started to listen to cricket broadcasting, the BBC was it, and the cricket broadcasting glittered with metaphor and simile. And O'Neill goes out and disapprovingly prods this spot, rather like an old lady with an umbrella, really, and returns to his place. It was equal to good literature. You widened your vocabulary listening to it as well, because I knew the game, and, and then you'd hear this intonation, three strips, gully, point, cover, extra cover, and a very long off, and the midweek is so deep that you may drown and stuff like that, and the pores would raise. And a lot of us boys at Queen's Royal College would go around repeating this stuff. And then when they're looking at a match, you'd always have a commentator, some boy commentator, who was commentating on the match with all of that language. And the master of it, at the center of it, was John Allen. Bedsir heaves his shoulders, swings his arms back behind him until they meet rolls his sleeve again, and comes, pounding ever optimistically in from the Radcliffe Road end, bowls to Weeks, and Weeks throws his bat at a ball wide outside his off stump. A, a most impudent stroke. That ball was a yard wide of the off stump. Almost any other batsman in the world would have let it go by, but not Weeks. And now he's 98, waiting on his 100. And now here's Bedser, comes in, bowls to Weeks, and he played that stroke again right through the offside for four and a century. One doesn't invent things about cricket commentary because you don't need to invent them. So much happening all the time. You've got the two things, three things. You've got the actual mathematics of the game. They're essential. Those you must keep up to date. Then you've got the mechanics of the play, which you're observing, a fourth thing, I suppose, you've got the background of the play, the buildings outside, the people around the ground, and finally you've got the history of the, of the whole game, not just this match. Sometimes, obviously, the play itself is so dramatic that you've only time for the mathematics and the action, nothing of the surrounding circumstances, and nothing of back history. But on other occasions, when the play's quiet, then surroundings and history, it's, it's just a question of 
one tries to talk interestingly as if one were talking to a friend who couldn't see or who wasn't there and you were talking over the telephone to him. A musical, The Batsman's Bride, had been written in honour of Arlott and his colleagues, with the great man making an appearance as a sort of commentating Greek chorus. And the comedy duo Tony Fane and David Evans realised that if you wanted to perfect an imitation of him, you actually needed two voices. One hour since I spoke to you last, no runs have been scored and no further wickets have fallen. But this is probably due to the fact that there's been no play going that time. Well, that's about all we have time for for now. So these are John Arlott saying goodbye to you and returning you to the studio. My early memories are of John Arlott, Norman Yardley being the expert, Alan Gibson, Rex Alston, um, Jack Fingleton, some legendary names there. And Arlott and people like that gave me that impression um, that you could create a word picture. You could actually, thousands of miles away, feel what was happening, uh, and, and they were marvellous at it. Another who enjoyed Test Match Special on the World Service was cricket writer and broadcaster, now BBC Sports editor, Mihir Bose. What Test Match Special did in its early days when I heard it, that it spawned an entire generation in India and around the world who wanted to be like John Arlott. Now, they couldn't ever be like John Arlott, and if you heard those um, fellow Indians of mine trying to be like John Arlott, it was quite comical. But nevertheless, the fact that they wanted to be, that they that set the yardstick of doing that, um, was, was, I think, tremendous. <coughs> Statham turns. The light Cambridge blue sight screen behind him. Comes in. Bowls to Roy. Roy gets over it. He's caught at the wicket. You do need to be a wordsmith, I think, particularly on the radio. You can't just drone on about extra cover drives and googlies. And you, you just can't do that. You, you, you have to broaden it out. Does that put a pressure on you as a commentator that you know you've got to raise your game? It's not just about the cricket, but you've got to be searching for the metaphor, searching for something that's poetic. That puts a, a, a pressure on you. Yes, it does. And again, that's, that's an interesting point. I mean, I, my language expanded working with Fred Truman. <laughs> <laughs> Has mind contracted listening to him? I don't know. The more you try to help them, the less notice they take of you. Well, you want it to be an intelligent programme. Yeah, I don't want it to be a, a, you know, a, a lads, uh, you know, gathering together and talking about boys' things. You know, it, it's not that sort of programme, and it's it's survived and thrived because it. Again, we go back to that word appeal. It's so important that it it, it maintains that sort of attraction to people. I've got here, you probably haven't seen this before, this is the audience research from 1957 when it first <laughs> came on air. And interestingly, nowadays people are sort of given names, but on the audience research, the BBC department described people's wife of university lecturer who said, best idea the BBC have had for years. Uh, we have a local government auditor who said, portables appear in the office by magic. And when the suspense is too great, are switched on. <laughs> It's the editor of this, uh, the, the audience research. So a number of those who had spent a good deal of time listening to the commentaries apparently felt life was going to be rather dull now that the match was over. And the following comment from the wife of a district forestry officer, summing up her reaction to the five days broadcast, is typical of many more. She said, A most competent and complete coverage of all five days play with excellent summaries and conjectures by E.W. Swanton. It's always pleasant to hear the soft, diffident voice of Mr. A. Black and that artist in words and creator of atmosphere, Mr. Arlott. And in a sense... That's that's your role, isn't it, to be artists in words and creators of atmosphere? Yes, it is, and even more so when the cricket might be dull. I mean, cricket commentary is easy when the cricket's exciting, because any, anyone worth their salt can describe that. Uh, you know, runs flowing or wickets tumbling, excitement. Um, but you will regularly get a stint in a test match where for the all 20 minute stint you don't get a single run scored, uh, and that is when you've got to be creative. On the whole, England's openings have not been impressive. Malone. The boy could he gets that away wide of Thompson at mid on for a single. And he takes the lead from Brearley by 39 to 37. And this at the moment bears close resemblance to a pursuit of my youth, which was known as the slow bicycle race. <laughs> and the winner was the last one to cross the finishing line. And I must say these two are not so much neck and neck as bottom to bottom. I think the, the great strength of the programme is not just the style of the commentary, which always has that lightness of touch, which is actually very difficult to do, but the whole rhythm of the programme. Sports writer and former England player Sarah Potter. 
from the commentators through to the summarizers and the way you know there's a, a deft sort of sideways shimmy and suddenly you know they're talking about a, the latest hit film or somebody's um, dress sense or, or whatever so it's able to effortlessly change gears through the the course of a day which makes it sort of so sustainable and so it's such a pleasure to listen to uh, bit of bad news Nick in Neighbours has sprained his ankle falling off his skateboard. <laughs> oh dear, well these things do happen. And here is Capital Day. Bill's outside the Ulstam. A lovely stroke square on the offside going right down to the boundary there. Former England batsman Graham Fowler has experienced it at first hand. You just end up developing conversations that sort of last a bit longer than 10 seconds and they just develop into themes and before you know it you've got you're talking about something very real which is happening in front of you and then you switch to something which develops into something surreal and it's not really planned a policeman comes tripping down the grandstand balcony there he's just coming down the steps at the double and now he's walking onto the scaffolding i don't know what he's doing rather urgently he's walking here comes Bracewell. having a discussion with a few of the lads in front of the pavilion yesterday about nicknames the australians Seem to make it a, a bit of an art form. Tug of war, that's uh, Stephen, and his brother is known as Afghanistan, the Forgotten War. Swampy Marsh. Hughes bowls to Gower, and Gower drives away on the offside. It's a nice looking shot out through extra cover. cover. Our policeman is still perambulating at some speed. He's just passed another cover. Three members of the ground staff, a television crew, a tractor. And I, he looks as though he's got some. Very yeah, definite objective in view. Possible. The umpires are now using their walkie-talkies, which for some reason the ICC seem bent on abandoning the idea of having walkie-talkies, but it makes absolute sense for the umpires to be able to communicate with people, whoever it might be, and this is just one classic example. Well, they use them everywhere else. They might as well use them here. Well, they might as well. Every time so, I get on the train, they're ringing, carrying on. <laughs> this, oh, it is annoying. Our policeman did reappear then and walked off left, right, left in very formidable order behind the sight screen. So, he, PC 49 is we might get him on the right hand. There he is, he's appeared. How exciting. <laughs> Here is. At Jones. one time, you used to be able to get on the train, have a cup of coffee, read the paper, close your eyes, have a little nap. Now there's the telephones ringing and people making bids for this and making bids for that. Oh, it does annoy me on that train. And it's a shame because the trains on the East Coast service there are beautiful trains. They really are. He's passing some colleagues sitting on a bench there. Doesn't even give them a look. And here comes Jones. Bowles Lamb uses his feet and drives for four. Hadley dives to his left at mid off. Can't mm -hmm. get to it. And the policeman, look, it's bobbled over the rope. And the policeman's gone under the tarpaulin there. But the Bullies are taking his helmet off and has fielded the ball. What a splendid journey our Bobby's had. Do you think he's enjoyed it? I don't want to know about people. Say, no, I'm, I'm not going to pay more than 200 non thousand for that. I know. <laughs> well, I offered him £300,000 a few weeks ago, and I don't think it's worth that now. I don't want to know. It's a very English thing. I mean, it's full of innuendo. It, it's full of end-of-the-peer humour. But it's all quite nicely disguised. I'm joined by the balls, bo <laughs> by, by, by the boil, You're sitting alongside me. Welcome back, Boyle. Thank you very much. As... Uh, Hadley comes up now, and Burles is one well pitched up outside the off stump and hit away to Edgar at cover, and there's no run. And Patterson, I can reveal, by courtesy of Tony Cozia, is bowling in a box. And I've known of no other bowler ever in the history of cricket who has bowled in a box. And I'll tell you why in a moment. He comes in. Basically, the, the cranial capacity of a skull can provide a reasonable estimate of the size of an animal's brain. So there we are. Eh? I think Humpty Dumpty was quite clever. That means Humpty Dumpty bowls, <laughs> or worn bowls, and it takes. <laughs> oh dear, I don't believe I said that. <laughs> it takes uh, Smith on the pad and rolls out to mid wicket. Oh, look, but he was in control of the shot. And Gooch goes to five and the total to seven. Well, the reason is that he follows through with his right arm and uh, sometimes hits himself in a painful place. So it's really rather extraordinary, then. That could be a champagne moment, you know. <laughs> Umpty Dumpty comes into bowl. I'm just hoping that, the, for some technical reason, the uh, the uh, tape recorders in the van weren't running at that particular moment. <laughs> yes, they were, says an engineer. Warren comes in and bowls, and that's left alone by Smith outside the off stump. I've got a feeling that moment will come back to haunt me at some stage.
Do you still have your detractors? I mean, back in 1957, the audience research, uh, <laughs> a retired tram driver, for instance, wrote, <laughs> all would be better employed at work. The country, <laughs> the country needs tons, not runs. And the wife of a civil servant thought it a terrible idea. Quote, a background of cricket all day is not conducive to happy marital relations. <laughs> it was bad enough at lunchtime and tea time before. Yeah, it, it, does, it does have some. Of course it does. There are people who, who like their long wave programmes on Radio 4 and, and, and they want, they want us on there. Um, but that's, I think it has calmed down a lot. It has been shunted around the schedules, almost like a, a programme looking for a channel. Mm. Uh, and there's a, a lot of politics about, about where it is and particularly in the last few years. How has that affected the programme? Well, that's a good question. Um, I mean, when I first joined, we, I think, went certainly through three networks in almost as many years at one stage. Every step of Test Match Special's career has been another difficult bit of BBC politics because for every programme that, uh, that we might do, we're taking something off the air, in fact, for a considerable length of time, which won't be popular, and we are well aware of that. Peter Baxter... In fact, in 1957, they seriously debated ending the struggle for frequencies by abandoning the programme after just one year. The fact that they didn't meant we ended up with gloriously catty moments like this from 1992. You're tuned to BBC Radio 3 FM, and that was the last scheduled music on this frequency for today, until, if all goes according to plan, about ten past six. Because in three minutes or so, music gives way to cricket. Well, that's doubtless part of the national arts strategy, which we've been hearing about in third year all this week. Don't blame the BBC, though. It's the radio authority, as was, that took away our medium wave frequency. There were a number of people who'd stumbled across us for the first time and suddenly, to their surprise, found that we were quite good company on an afternoon. So they stuck with it, which is immensely rewarding to get that sort of reaction from people. So you lucky cricket fans, you're spoilt for choice. Here on BBC Radio 3 FM, though, you do have the extra advantage of stereo cricket for the first time, which means that in a moment or two, Jonathan Agnew will be where the first violins were, and Trevor Bailey will be approximately where the double basses were. Unless, that is, you favour the Stokowski orchestral layout with the basses in the middle. It's now known as the Brearley position. Well, there we have it. Well into the programme, and some lovely cricket. A bit of useful history, and mercifully, only one cake. The city of Sheffield Centenary cake has just been carried in by horse and dray, and uh, Gooch defends away on the offside. Oh, no can cake. you really lift that? What a strong man you are. It's the biggest cake I've ever seen. Boyle, well, you helped me just now pack a very delightful cake, which comes, people may be surprised, we're in the heart of uh, south-east London, and there's a farm here, the Vauxhall City Farm. And they sent us this cake, and it's from free laid eggs, and they say they've got goats, sheep, and many more animals, especially an old Doster spot sow. Brian Johnson, someone gave him a cake for the commentary box, innocently enough, and um, he thanked them. He thought it would be rude not to. That's the way he was brought up, of course. And so the next day, maybe another cake arrived from somebody who thought, oh, I can get a mention on the air, and, and dear old Jonas would thank them. And, and then I had to sort of guard against him because he was always saying, aren't people nice? And, uh, and he'd open a cake and say, oh, this is dear old Betty from her cake shop. And I said, well, that's an advertisement for Betty's cake shop, Jonas. You really can't say that. And so there'd be a bit of that. We'd have, have a bit of a battle about that. But some days, just incredible, the Saturdays of Headingley Tests, you'd get these piles of cakes. I mean, I got to know where various children's hospitals were so that we could drop off a few cakes that had been delivered to the commentary box. And then you'd get the sort of delightful young lad who would stick his head round the door and says, Mum says, can us have tin back at end of day? You know, and the, uh, a, a tin would be thrust into your hand with a cake inside it. There's some great concoctions, but the pinnacle had to be reached when Her Majesty the Queen presented us with a cake in the committee room at Lord's um, a few years ago. Arlott used to uh, complain he didn't, wasn't very much into the cakes, and then on one occasion he said, oh, please don't send us cakes. Uh, uh, why don't you send us champagne or something useful? And he was hugely embarrassed because within half an hour, two bottles of beautifully chilled champagne arrived in the commentary box. It always needs, I think, a richness of characters and a richness of voices. I'm always slightly sad that, that uh, 
David Lloyd Bumble, who had a great voice, great, you know, super cricket. Hey, look at that bowling, cafeteria bowling, it's help yourself, all that stuff. <laughs> so uh, it's sad, really, that he, he, he went to television because you need that mix of voices, don't you? You do, and it keeps people like you in business. Because unfortunately, if you've got a bland, boring old voice like me, uh, you, you can't take it off. Well, but there's a few that, I mean, there's, there's CMJ, there's you, there's Vic Marks, there's Mike Selvey. I mean, one gets on one's knees and thanks God for blowers. <laughs> a low-level pigeon goes past, almost hugging the ground, having a look at the members in the pavilion. The lady in a bright orange shirt walks up the uh, seats there on the grandstand balcony. She's got a bit large pigtail, too. Here is Lewis. Bowles Rans will dry. What a fantastic stroke. That was a no-ball, but my goodness me. Talking of Lewis, I mean, one does feel that it, you know he, he is sort of there. When one talks about an artist in words, the creator of atmosphere, and one does really almost, it's almost a pity when he comes back to the cricket, because he talks about dear and, and right. about uh, and, a, and a workman with a rather large tummy and an orange wheelie bin. Do you no, have... I mean, blows, blows is magnificent. He is magnificent. Um, he, he gets a little bit confused by people's names these days. He, he, <laughs> he was fumbling around a couple of years ago for this Pakistani substitute fielding at mid-on. And he, he, a few techniques you do employ when you're trying to find this name. He has, he's desperate for him to turn around. It was a one-day game. His name was on his back. But this chap <laughs> would not turn around. And so after a couple of his, our old friend, he slipped Yasser Arafat, uh, <laughs> which surprised everyone, not least the mid fields when, and no doubt the leader of the PLO at the time. But uh, well, quite how he got to that, I don't know. And a great turn of phrase. I remember once he was talking about Gladstone Small. He said, "And there's Gladstone Small." I mean, you know, he's he's walking back, but he does walk back to his uh, to his marker ungovernably slowly. <laughs> no, no, wait a minute. No, no, wait a minute. He's being given out. Out, 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 out. out, 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 out. So he has. Out, so he has. Out, rash stroke. Rash stroke. Yes. Head right in the air. TMS has always been gloriously open to parody. This is from the 1960s radio series. I'm sorry, I'll read that again. Must have been stumped. No, no, clean bowl, trying to sweep. Silly shot. Silly shot. Silly shot. Silly shot, yes. But we have had a jolly good morning's cricket, haven't we? Mm. Oh, absolutely. Well, that's great. Arthur, bold Goddard. No, no, he's not out. No, he's not no, out. He's not out. He's not out. No, he's he's not out. out. No, no. Well, well, what a relief for him. What a relief. What a relief. What a relief. Yeah, Arthur is still there with a uh, 20... Um, uh, so, uh, anyway, he's still there. He's still there. And what a good morning's cricket we've had. And as we return to the studio, we say again, a, th- a thoroughly entertaining and absorbing morning's cricket. Quite, quite. We may not know much about the game, but at least we're gentlemen. Yep. <laughs> I think at times it was in danger of becoming a bit too cosy. I can understand why it should become cosy, because that is the English character, if you like. You know, the defence of the Realm Act passed in 1940 was called Dora. You know, there's that sort of English uh, Englishness to be cosy. But I think at times it was over-elaborated. I see now that it actually sustained a sort of export-only version of England. Me here, Bows. The question is whether that version was laced with arrogance, or even at its worst, a hint of colonialism although it's difficult to level that charge at a programme that's always sought to avoid nationalism. One thing we never do is use the word we, or we shouldn't use the word we. Newer commentators sometimes do when referring to the England team. Uh, We try and be as neutral as we can, and that is absolutely critical, I think, to the enjoyment of of the whole match. People know they can trust the judgement of the commentators, or I hope they can. TMS. It's not about England winning. It, it, it isn't. It, it, we, we love it when England win. We rejoice when England win, but not, not on the air. We are just impartial observers who, who love cricket and will just delight in whatever happens on any particular day on a cricket field. OK, so no nationalism. But what about elitism? Sport is traditionally a great leveller, but then so is a steamroller. Is TMS politically incorrect? Let's ask the politicians. I'm Andrew George, um, MP for the West Cornwall and Isles of Scilly constituency of St Ives. Kate Hoey, Member of Parliament for Vauxhall in London. Mark Field, I'm the Conservative Member of Parliament for the cities of London and Westminster. In a lot of walks of life, there's a sort of sense of, you know, you have to be one of the clubbable public school sort of toffee-nosed people in order to do certain types of things. And I don't know whether Test Match Special falls into that particular school or not. If that's the case, it's a great pity. I'd like to think it was more eclectic, more open, more easy for a broader range of people to get in and and involved in it. Oh, I think the idea that it's elitist is complete nonsense. I've been on it about three times and I didn't go to a private school. I actually think the BBC generally does very well with different types of accents and, and I actually don't see why anyone should worry about how somebody speaks. And 
you know, the fact that um, you always get a really lovely piece of cake when you're there is, is, is really the bribe that would get anybody on to the test. Perhaps I need to make a cake to yeah. get on. That's right. <laughs> My I, cake I, making I, there's skills an element to which there's an element of elitism, I suppose, in cricket, and it's, a, it's seen as a bit public schooly in TMS, I think, to, to a large degree. Although, in many ways, I think the way in which both Channel 4 and before that Channel 5 and, and Sky have adapted the game with Snickometer and, uh, and all the other devices has been fantastic. And I think that has helped TMS actually also come into its own. It, that element of choice has, I think, ensured that all the standards of coverage, both on the radio and television, have, have improved. The reality is that these days, still very few of our state schools play cricket and therefore certain people who've come from different types of school and have really played cricket are more likely to want to be involved in it. I think what's important is that the people who are there love cricket and yes of course the, if England's playing they're going to be supporting in Wales but reality is they actually care about cricket enough to be much less sort of nationalistic than we get in commentaries in other sports so I, I think that that's a very important point. It's not unusual to find, you know, the the poshest bloke standing next to a bloke from a working men's club at a cricket match and getting on perfectly well. I think that's one of the great things about the game. And it's also one of the great things about Test Match Special. I mean, if they ever comment on, on my broadcasting on Test Match Special, it's usually to do, 99% of the time, it's to do with me broadcasting with Henry Blofeld. And the only conclusion I can come to is because he's very Etonian and I'm very Akrintonian. Test match special is quirky, and yes, you have got a couple of cut glass accents in there still, but you know, there's a place for that too. And they're coming from people who, who talk about CMJ, he's massively knowledgeable about the game, and his love of the game comes across in with almost every sentence. He's very, very good at what he does. Oh, so there we are, Sarah Potter and Foxy Fowler. And on the subject of our knowledge of the game, I've just been handed another letter by my producer up here, St. Peter. Oh, thank you, Perlers. And it says, Dear Johnners, can you sort out once and for all this business of field placings and names? Well, let's have a try with the help of one of my more fluent commentaries from 1974. Well, it's Fletcher now facing Beatty, and he comes right forward and plays a classical defensive stroke just down the pitch, and Wadica comes from forward, short, um, silly point rarely I suppose we can call it or he's going a bit square at point call him point very close in there he's just in front of the popping crease Close himself is going to backward short leg he's making aim as a second gully or a third slip so there's a slip a backward short leg in this point position somewhere between a third slip and a second gully <laughs> two slips two gullies one of them rather fine a backward short leg we could keep her standing back six men in the close catching positions backward cover short third man it's quite a little... two slips third man <laughs> <laughs> deep gully cover mid off mid on square leg and long leg the field <laughs> excuse me i've got to pick up for some reason and fielded at cover by a ramper cash christopher martin jenkins in 1993 obeying rule one keep going Whatever happens. Two slips, third man. <laughs> Deep gully, cover, mid off, mid on, square leg and long leg the field. I'm trying to time my hiccup so that it's not what I'm talking. In. Walk in and burst outside the off stump and uh, left alone by the left handed ta Taylor who's playing. I have known balls be missed and the, the frisson that goes round the box when it happens. It's quite extraordinary. There are people who say, oh, they don't describe the cricket, they're just whispering on about cakes all the time, don't see the reaction if somebody does talk through a ball and doesn't describe it. <laughs> <laughs> now, if we pushed our score out through the window and he was disappearing, you'd have a shock then. I haven't got hiccups. <laughs> <laughs> but that would shock him. <laughs> well, it, it, would, it would be really rather amusing. <clears throat> Excuse me, this next ball. Oh, <coughs> my throat's gone. <coughs> you swallowed a bit. Thank you. I think I have a, a bug or something. Peter Baxter with a drink. Thank you. This is the shock of remembering one of your test wickets that's finally got to you, I think. <coughs> oh, that's better. <laughs> off he goes. And bowls outside the off stump. That's worked way down to third man. And there's no run. <laughs> Got some of the little thunderflies that have been buzzing around over the last couple of days. I think it's gone straight down the wrong way. Plenty of room to get in, though, wasn't there? <laughs> now, as you probably know, the lowest total in Test cricket was the 26 by New Zealand 
against England at Auckland in 1954-55 and someone perhaps has shot himself. I hope not, but there was a sound very like it in the crowd. Here comes Arnold. Oh, now there's a commotion in the stand way over to my right and a couple of rather burly riot police firing randomly into the crowd. <laughs> oh, dear, oh, dear. And, uh, oh, I'm getting news of the capture of Osama bin Laden. <laughs> well, well, I dare say. Uh, here comes Hoggard now. He's in, he bowls. Gibbs pushes it out on the offside. And, and there, there is. is no run. It was interesting. We always used to listen to it on the school bus coming home. And... Uh, the bus driver would have Radio 2 on, and we'd say, no, no, put, put Radio 3 on, because it was on Radio 3 medium wave in those days. And you put it on, and it did sound like, they didn't talk anything like us, but it sounded like they were bringing you important news, because they spoke a bit like newsreaders. Or it was a bit like when you went to see a play. I remember going to see a play in the sixth form at the Royal Shakespeare Company in Stratford, and we got on the bus, we went down, we were listening to the cricket on the way down, then you get to the play... They're a bit like that. They are posh people, but the posh people are telling you interesting things. Poet Ian Macmillan, capturing the essence of TMS. Posh people telling you interesting things. But let's forget the accents for a moment and remember that in the right hands, cricket commentary has even been described as verging on the poetic. Gilmore comes in, bowls, and Lloyd hits him. High away over oh, mid wicket for four. Stroke of a man knocking a thistle top off with a walking stick. No trouble at all. And it takes Lloyd to 99. I think cricket commentary and poetry are two very separate arts. The thing about poetry is you take your time with it. You sit there with your page and your drafts and your ideas and you'll work on it. The art of cricket commentary is a completely separate thing. It's the art of the storyteller, the stand up comedian the person doing the best man's speech, the person who buttonholes you in the pub, and the person who was at the match when you weren't, who tells you about it. And also that thing that Arlott could do where he could look at something and describe it in a in a way that was was poetic but not poetry. And Liakad comes in, bowls to Gower, and Gower turns and hits it for a full duck cricket for four behind square leg. Oh, what a princely entry. Yeah. He is a good player, this boy. Perhaps the one really class batsman in the side. And he's hit his first ball in test cricket for four. And if that doesn't make him feel better, he's a very odd young man as well as a brilliant one. There's rhythm in there. It sounds like you're listening to some person in medieval times who's telling you a story. Or you're listening to some kind of bard, or you're listening to some kind of tribal poet or griot just telling you a tale. There is about Dexter when he chooses to face fast bowling with determination, a, a sort of air of command that lifts him, or seems to lift him, above ordinary players. He seems to find time to play the fastest of bowling and still retain dignity, something near majesty as he does it. All bowls, Dexter flicks down the leg side, another no ball, and Hall hangs his head quite penitently. He was describing a square cut by about 10 weeks. And he said, he delivers, weeks is on the back foot and cut him a square as a beatnik's grandmother. Here comes both of them running in, rather like a shy horse cresting the breeze. I think there was a New Zealand bowler called Cunis. Bob Cunis. Bob, Bob Cunis came out to bat. John Arlott was on commentary. And he said, here to bat, number 11... Cunis. Strange name, Cunis. Neither one thing nor the other. Proving that ribald humour was alive and giggling long before Brian Johnston arrived full-time in the early 70s. But when he did join, he brought with him a style and established traditions that have lasted to this day. The ritual wearing of the primary club tie on Saturdays to support the charity raising money for blind and partially sighted sport. And the Saturday lunchtime interview... And he's looking View from the boundary. Smart, and his name is Willie Rushton. Willie, nice to Good see morning. you in the box. And never knowingly, having made a knot, which is why I'm not wearing my primary club tie. 
You n I can't remember ever having made an order, nor can I remember ever having dropped a catch. They tell me your memory is not what it was. It's not what it was. <laughs> <laughs> there are these very useful parts this of the brain. This distinguished and eccentric uh, gentleman <laughs> is sitting with us, and he come up the M1, and uh, the first thing, interesting thing about him, uh, before I tell you who he is, is he lives within about 100 yards of where I do, and I've never seen him uh, walking around St. John's Wood. But, oh, but no, I have seen you. Oh, you've never yes. come up to me and asked my autograph. Well, I didn't come up to you ask you because you were actually in the off-license. <laughs> and oh. you, were, you were actually um, oh. negotiating with the, the off-license keeper who was offering you some Christmas champagne. You said, no, I don't need champagne because I'm given so much of it. Who never did? <laughs> <laughs> that is the voice of Eric Idle giving away a secret. But you mean to say you were in the shop then? I was in the shop, and I thought that was very impressive, that you don't have to buy Christmas champagne. <laughs> well, some friends of mine are just... <laughs> the list of guests over the years rivals Desert Island Discs, the only proviso being that they all have an interest, however slight, in the game of cricket. And it's given the other commentators a chance to try their hand at interviewing. I can't help thinking that as a leg spinner on the moon, you, you'd get rather exciting bounce, wouldn't you? Well, it's very difficult, I think. After all, you only have one-sixth Earth gravity. So on the moon, you'd only have one-sixth your Earth weight, which strikes me personally as being a jolly good idea. That's a good start. I'm very fond of the gasometers. I don't know why. Well, how can you be fond of a gasometer? But there they are, and I'm very fond well, of Well, those little ones which go down, the big one stays up, which is very strange. I, I've said. heard that, but I don't want to hear about your private life. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the unmistakable sound of the Stranglers. And I'm delighted to welcome their former lead singer, Hugh Cornwell, to the Test Match Special. You haven't performed on Radio 4 Longwave live before, have you? No, I haven't. <laughs> no, <laughs> we are about to. We, we, we heard um, a, a little bit of Golden Brown there, but come on, it's a, it's a beautiful song, and you're armed, okay. actually, not with your guitar, but this, no. is, this is Mike Selvers. Mike Selvers, yeah, it's a very nice. I used to, uh, My first acoustic guitar was a Yamaha guitar, and this is one, and he's kindly lent it to me, and it's... Uh, it, it works very well. Well, this is a very sort of rudimentary version of Golden Brown because I'm, I'm uh, just by myself, so it's uh, like this. Desmond Tutu was another one who just sat down unannounced sorry, one day, and all these people come in. There's a constant coming and going of people who just quickly try and get your mind up. You, you've come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, well, I was a victim of John. It was very early. It yeah. was 1985, I think. It was at uh, Edgbaston. And he said, come on, Brummers. And he got me into the Lord's Taverners. And he said, oh, great cricket lover. Come and come into the box and, and do a view from the boundary and we'll have a little chat. And so we chatted away. And of course, he then said, no, you did a good impression of uh, Benno, so Richie Benno. Uh, let's have a little bit of that. And so I started off and doing all this, uh, well, it's a wonderful day out there today. And I began to hear that chortling. And, you know, you could see people sort of elbowing each other. And uh, you had that horrible feeling. Of course, I turned around and there was Richie Benno saying, Where are the royalties? That's what I want to know. Oh, what a setup! Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> the, <I> thought, <laughs> come on in, the real Richie Benno. Oh my goodness <laughs> me. Uh, Benno, is, um, uh, uh, do you recognise yourself when you hear him doing it? <laughs> well, I, I don't think anyone knows uh, exactly what their voice is, but uh, that's not the point. Where are the royalties? Never a frown With golden brown Fabulous. And Mike Selby now knows what his guitar should sound like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, that's terrific. You see, if all punk music sounded like that, I think, I think I'd have liked it. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, OK. <laughs> Is it easy to compose a, a cricket song? Oh, oh it, it, absolutely. Does the best one suddenly stop and... Uh, we did a lovely song. Was, oh, jolly good shot. Oh, well played, sir. Oh, well let alone. Oh, he's hit him on the bone. Did he hit him on the head? No, he's hit him on the leg. I think the fellow's dead. No, he's getting up again. Oh, it's just a bit of rum. No, he's hit him on the bum. Did he... <laughs> he's out. Is he out? He's out. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> we had about 15 people singing this very, very tightly. <laughs> Let's have the second verse. <laughs> Quintessential <laughs> test match special. Laughter and bubbling conversation, punctuating a steady flow of uninterrupted cricket coverage. A nice letter from a chap called Gary Casson, who relates a good story. His team had two people. One was a young bowler called Roy Ainsco, and um, the father was the umpire, and he was called Roland Ainsco. Yeah, is this one from Wall, this one on the leg stump, push forward, goes to mid-wicket and there's no run there. And um, they had a match and the whole thing depended on the last ball and this young boy Roy was bowling and he ran up to bowl, hit the batsman on the pad and his father, the umpire, appealed and the boy gave it out and they all went off the field. <laughs> now, it's the first time I've known an umpire appealing and the bowler giving it out. Have you ever heard that one? Sir? Not heard that one, no. No. Well, that is... You'd only be sent to you, that one. <laughs> And they all went off laughing, which is, um, I don't know if they do that in a test match. A vicious looking insect appears on our uh, window here. We're used to seeing flies, maybe the odd wasp in a commentary box. I hate to think what that is. It's a monster, isn't it? <laughs> I'm sure what it is. He's on the outside, I guess, don't he panic. Is. Well, that's all right. Let's check in that everywhere is completely sealed. I think it is. We don't want that flying around in here. 
Oh dear, very. It's got six legs. It must be at least an inch long with these enormous antenna. Oh. This is uh, played off the front foot by Callis up to short extra cover. And there's no run. Now he's holding play up for some something unusual, which is looks like a mouse running across the field, is it? It's gone to Dexter, who's picking it up. Yes, it looks like a mouse, is it, Freddie? Yes, it's run up to the stumps now. Well, that's quite an invasion. <laughs> looks rather a big mouse. I think it is one, it's looking through the glasses. <laughs> well, mouse stopped play. I think that must be a record, Rick. I think it must be. And have you ever, in your commentary, committed the cardinal sin, missed a ball? I, I hope not, not live. Um, I did commentate once when we weren't on air with Geoffrey Boycott, who wasn't, who wasn't aware <laughs> that we weren't on air. We were at yesterday in Parliament, we were in South Africa. And so I did commentate there um, and say, you were the most boring batsman <laughs> in the world, weren't you? And he looked at me slightly askance first time. I'd commentate another ball. I said, come on, Jeffrey." I said, they used to, they used to they fill the bars up when you came out. But you were dreadful. And in comes Donald and bowls to Allerton. And, and his face, you can see him steaming up. <laughs> Until finally, about 10 minutes later after this wind-up, I said, well, no, welcome back on Radio 4. Listen, you weren't with us. <laughs> Jeffrey Boycott thought you were. And uh, his face, I mean, he took it very well, the old boy. Well, I'll, but, have, uh, I'll have thee for that, I guess. I'll have thee. Well, we're coming towards the end of play here, and there's just time for me to mention a few things they've left out. Do we get any Donna Simmons, the first female voice on Test Match Special? Nixon McLean dismissed a 4-11 on the West Indies all out for 159. Mm. England will feel very pleased with their day's work. Oh, well. <laughs> Perhaps we'll get a bit more from the ladies in the next 50 years. Uh, now, you might have heard there the occasional grunt in the background. Uh, that was Bearders, the TMS scorer Bill Frindle, Bearded Wonder. A regular since 1966, but uh, he deserves a programme to himself. And there's the alderman, Don Mosey. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, oh yes, has CMJ recovered from his hiccups yet? I would like to be able to take a deep breath and, and hold it, which sometimes works, but, but um, hope for a long break between uh, overs and an eloquent performance by you, Trevor. <laughs> oh. Just worth hearing that seamless Trevor Bailey pick up again, I think. <laughs> oh. oh, very droll. Now, I know we've managed to avoid bias over the years, but is there a chance of one or two glorious English moments as a final flourish? There's one I'd particularly like to hear. Nurse faces up to Dolly Vera and he bowls him! He made no attempt at a stroke and he's clean bowled by Dolly Vera, his first test wicket. Truman in again. Bowls to Hawk and Hawk goes forward and he's caught. There's the 300! Shaftesbury runs up now around the wicket, bowls to Gooch, Gooch, he just tickles it, that's it! He's got his 300, he tickles it down, the long leg, and Gooch is 300, not out. Lily to Botham. In now, he bowls, Botham swings his way through mid square leg, it's going to be four runs, I think. Up now, now he bowls to Hughes, who's going back, he's in the air, he's out, he's caught, he's caught by Botham. As Willis is in, bowls now to Yallop, he bowls, Yallop comes forward, he's out, he's caught, forward, short leg, he's caught by Gatting. It it's lively. There's an atmosphere. They're, 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 they're starting to scent uh, victory. And if they do pull victory off, what a sensational performance it will have been. Willis. Bows to Lawson, who edges it, and he's caught by Taylor. Willis in. Bows to Lily. Lily hits his knee. He's going to be caught, I think. No, yes, he is. He's caught by Gatting at mid-on. Uh, he chipped that one up. Gatting ran in. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Pulse rates. <laughs> I wonder how many heart attacks around the country, people watching this on television, listening to it over the radio. Well, it's Willis now. Willis to Bright. Bright is 19, Australia 111 for 9, 19 short of victory. Here's Willis in, bowls to Bright. Bright bowled! The middle stamps out of the ground, England have won. They've won by 18 runs. Willis runs around, punching the air. The bales are removed by umpire Bowden, he throws one in the air. And England have won the Ashes, finally. What about the future? I mean, it's had a glorious past, and of course we're celebrating the 50th anniversary. Um, how do you see the future? As long as it retains its sort of intelligence, if you like, that's a very pompous sounding word for someone who wouldn't claim to be the least bit intelligent, but <laughs> just something more than just a sports commentary. If it ever became that, it would be a very sad day. It's working, people aren't switching off. It's appealing to people and it's giving them their love of cricket and sport in a way that is enjoyable. 
Why does it need to change? It brings joy to millions of people, millions and millions of people. Given the fact that in England much is made about the English reserve and so on, Test Match Special is like um, opening the door to a sort of nice place which otherwise wouldn't be open to you. And, you know, you feel you're, you're being welcomed into a sanctuary. It's a very significant sum of this because Peter Baxter, who is more than just a producer, I mean, he's been my companion for 17 years, really, uh, on every tour, and I'll miss him terribly you know as a friend more than anything else he has driven the program for most of those 50 years it seems and he retires well when i took over as cricket producer in 73 robert hudson was then the uh, head of uh, outside broadcasts and he said to me cricket commentary and test match special particularly was company it is a friendly program and we we happen to talk about the greatest game in the world but it's the company of the, the people keep with us while we talk about it i think that makes the program Jonathan Agnew, Peter Baxter, and before them, Graham Fowler, Kate Hoey, and Mihir Bose. And that's it. 50 Not Out, with new faces at the crease, new technology allowing listeners to interact with the commentators who remain their eyes and ears at the match. But crucially, the same game, and the same simple ball-by-ball coverage reflecting it. And there is one more thing. Oh, come on. You didn't seriously think I'd leave it out. After a few more words from Peter... It'll be Brian Johnston and Jonathan Agnew. I suppose we're going to have to mention the leg over incident. It's been voted as the greatest commentary ever, which I think is rather odd because it wasn't a commentary and it was really a mistake at the time. But it's the infectious nature of Brian Johnston's laugh and I have heard it probably more than any other person on the planet and it makes me laugh every time because I just see the tears rolling down Jonas's cheeks. He knew, this is the tragic thing about it, he knew exactly what was going to happen. He tried to step over the stumps and just flicked a bail with his, with his right hand. He tried to try do the splits over it and unfortunately uh, the inner part of his thigh must have just removed the bail. He just, just didn't quite get his leg over. Anyhow, he, he did very well indeed, batting 131 minutes and hit three fours. And um, then we had Lewis playing extremely well for his 47 not out. Agus, do stop it. Uh, and uh, he was joined by De Freitas, who um, was in for 40 minutes, a useful little partnership there. Uh, they put on 35 in 40 minutes, and then he was caught by Dujan Walsh. Um, Lawrence, uh, always entertaining, batted for 30, 35. 30, 35 minutes, hit a four over the week keepers. Beggars, <laughs> for goodness sake, stop it. Hit a four. Yes, Lawrence, about our own flight. <laughs> <Extremely> well. <laughs> he hit a four over the wee keeper's head, and he was out for the night. A tough little kid. Batted for 12 minutes, and then was caught by Haynes on Patterson for two, and there were 54 extras, and he got all out for 419. I've stopped laughing now. A classic moment. TMS Ball by Ball was presented by Rory Bremner and produced by Tom Alban.